Hello once again. We welcome you to Parasites and Health. I'm sure our introductory lecture was able to arouse enough interest in you for our subsequent lectures, and I'm sure that by now you must have subscribed to our lectures. Now, for the first lecture, we're able to grasp that there are two types of parasites microparasites and macroparasites, and that microparasites are small. They are made up of just a single cell and they multiply within their vertebrate hosts. Now, macroparasites are large, they are multicellular, and they have no direct reproduction within their vertebrate hosts. This group includes helminths. Helminths are worms. Remember, we have platyhelminths. And then we have nematodes. Now, in a series of lectures, the term parasite will be restricted to protozoans and helminths of medical importance. Now, on the basis of where they are found in the anatomy of their hosts, parasites can either be ectoparasites or endoparasites. If they are ectoparasites, it means that they are found on the body, on the surface of the skin, or superficially under the skin. Any parasite in this category is called an ectoparasite. And when ectoparasites cause an infection, we don't call the diseases that cause infection, we call them infestation. In other words, ectoparasites cause infestation. Now, endoparasites are found within the body of the host. All protozoans and helminths are endoparasites. And when they cause an infection or when they cause a disease condition in their host, they are said to cause an infection. So, you can sing it like a song, ectoparasites cause infestation, endoparasites cause infection in their hosts. Now, a host, like we saw from our first lecture, is an organism that provides the nourishment and shelter to the parasite. We have different types of hosts. You have a definite, what you call a definitive host. Now, a definitive host is that host that harbors the reproductive form of the parasite. It is a host in which sexual reproduction takes place. Or, the definitive host harbors the most highly developed form of the parasite. Now, where these things are not clear, just know that the definitive host is the mammalian host. The next category of hosts is the intermediate host. Now, this is the host that alternates with the definitive host in harboring the different stages of the life cycle of the parasite mainly the larval forms or the forms that carry out asexual reproduction. Now, we have seen a definitive host that harbors the sexually reproducing parasite and the intermediate host that harbors the sexually immature form of the parasite. Now, in some instances, a parasite may have more than one intermediate host, such that you have a first intermediate host and then a second intermediate host. In the course of our lectures, we will bring out these things in a fuller dimension. You also have what is called a paratonic host. It is a host in which the larva stage of the parasite survives but does not develop further. It is 
often not necessary in the life cycle of the parasites. We also have a reservoir host. It is a host that harbors the parasites and serves as an important source of infection to other susceptible hosts. Now, in epidemiology, reserve hosts are important in the control of parasitic diseases. Because if you control a parasite and you leave the reservoir host, chances are that the parasite will be transmitted back into human or animal population via the reservoir host. Now, we look at the concept of zoonosis or zoonotic infection. These are animal parasites that are also capable of infecting man. Now, examples of parasitic diseases that are zoonosis include Leishmaniasis, South American Trypanosomiasis or Chaga disease, Rhodesiasis Trypanosomiasis, infection due to Crichinella spiralis, Fasciola hepatica, Hydatid disease, etc., etc. There are also other forms of zoonotic diseases that are of medical importance. For instance, in the course of man-animal interaction, parasites of dogs or parasites of our pet cats can infect man. These ones are called larva migrants. We will take a closer look at them in the course of these lectures. Now, we now look at vector. We've talked about intermediate hosts. Just know that vectors are insects or they are arthropods that require a blood meal for their reproduction. When an intermediate host is a blood feeding arthropod, it is called a vector. A vector is active because it has the capacity to carry the organism from one definitive host to another definitive host. In other words, vectors harbor the infective stages of the parasites and are able to pick the infective stage from a definitive host to another definitive host. Now, there are also vectors that are known as mechanical vectors. What is the difference between a vector and a mechanical vector. A vector is a biological vector because as an intermediate host, the parasite must spend a composite part of its life cycle in the vector in order to complete it. But in mechanical vectors, the parasite is never a part of the biological process of the vector. Rather, the vector simply carries it mechanically from one point to another. Example, house flies. What they normally do because of their hairy bodies, they patch on one source of infection, pick up the infective stages, and then patch on another source and drop them there. And then from there, infection is initiated. So, the parasite does not pass through the biological system of the vector so they are called mechanical vectors but they are very important in the life cycle of parasites they have medical importance because they transmit a wide range of parasites from host to host or from the environment to the host let us also look at another mechanical vector cockroaches cockroaches are not biological vectors. They are mechanical vectors, but they can transmit a wide range of bacterial diseases to man. So we have recognized houseflies and cockroaches as mechanical vectors. In our next lecture, we're going to look at host parasite relationships. Remember I told you in the first lecture that a well-adapted parasite does not seek to destroy its host because if the host dies, the parasite will also die. But in the course of the interaction, you will know that the parasite deposits toxins and byproducts of its metabolism in the host 
and this triggers off a good number of negative reactions that may lead to illness or death. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, have you clicked the subscribe button? Have you clicked the bell? Thank you so much. We'll keep bringing you our lectures. Till I see you next. Bye bye.